you're looking to dive into topics on how to live a happier, healthier, more fit, and long lifespan, then you've come to the right podcast. Live in the dream with me, Coach Damian Evans. Together, we will explore the topics on all things health, fitness, and wellness. Together, we will be lifelong learners on this journey to living the ultimate dream. What up, Dream Team? Coach D here coming at you from beautiful, sunny San Diego. And welcome back to the Living the Dream podcast, where we finish the week off strong by covering how to properly fuel our bodies based on what works best for us individually in order for us to have our health, our fitness, and our wellness goals, and in order for us to live our own dream life. And today we're going to discover the vitamins, minerals, and supplements that research shows may help improve metabolic health, plus maybe the ones that you might want to skip. Optimal metabolic health requires more than watching your carbohydrate intake or getting enough protein and fat to support stable blood sugar. Yes, minding these macronutrients is essential, but many other nutrients and nutrient-like substances found in foods such as micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, uh, antioxidant phytochemicals, omega-3 fatty acids, which we're finding is super important, uh, fiber, and probiotic-rich bacteria. These are all unsung workhorses when it comes to supporting the body's vital metabolic processes. In the right quantities, these substances give you and your body the tools it needs to thrive on a cellular level. From a metabolic standpoint, they may help metabolize macronutrients. They may help deliver energy to the cells. They may help regulate glucose and manage your insulin production. And they also help reduce inflammation and much more that we're still finding out. But when you fall short, these processes can be disrupted, increasing your risk for poor metabolic health and a range of related chronic diseases. For example, specific vitamins and mineral deficiencies, these have been associated with obesity, with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic syndrome. According to surveys, a large percentage of Americans, their diets are deficient in critical micronutrients. For example, 94% of Americans don't get enough vitamin D. 53% don't get enough magnesium. 44% don't get enough calcium. Those are pretty high percentages. For some people, diets that contain a lot of processed foods and a lack of diversity of fruits and vegetables, these are what really cause deficiencies, these kind of diets. Even those who eat a healthy diet of whole or minimally processed foods with an emphasis on a variety of colorful plants, they can still come up short on certain nutrients because of declining soil quality, and inadequate nutrient absorption. What's more, for many vitamins, the RDA that a lot of people go to to decide how much they should be taking, those are the average daily level of intake sufficient just to meet nutrient requirements. This isn't necessarily the amount that will ensure your optimal health. This is the bare minimum. It's just for you to not have a disease, which... You know, I'm not really shooting for that metric. I'm trying to feel optimal. Knowing this, it's easy to see how certain dietary supplements could be beneficial because of just the way that our society and the way that our food system is set up. But what you should supplement with is kind of the question, what should I supplement with? Am I just throwing a bunch of money away on things that aren't really helping, aren't really moving the needle more than a fraction of a percent? And while recommendations may vary by person and should ideally be guided by a healthcare provider and appropriate lab testing, that should be the goal for everybody. I know it's really hard and I have a hard time doing this, but we should test and not guess. Get your blood work done on a very frequent basis, maybe quarterly would be awesome, or at least bi-yearly, just to see the direction of what your numbers are going. Do I have the optimal range? Am I in the healthy range? Am I declining? Am I increasing? What does that look like? And what is my future going to look like based on that? Uh, It's just super important to get that appropriate lab testing nowadays. And it's getting easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper, which is, which is nice. So today we're going to go over a little bit of a guide to learn which vitamins and micronutrients are difficult to get through your diet 
and are best consumed as a supplement, at least as of now, and how to choose a good brand to take it safely, and then also which ones we might want to just skip on. Uh, the best vitamins and supplements to consider for metabolic health. Let's start this thing off. Number one, ALA, alpha lipoic acid, ALA. This is an antioxidant compound produced in the mitochondria of cells where it assists enzymes in glucose metabolism. What does that mean? It helps your body to metabolize glucose, blood sugar, the sugar that gets made from breaking down the food that you eat. And with poor diet and lifestyle habits, as well as exposure to environmental chemicals and pollutants, this may increase a person's demand, making supplementing ALA potentially beneficial. As an antioxidant, ALA helps combat oxidative stress. And it does this by neutralizing harmful free radicals in the body that might otherwise damage cells and contribute to inflammation, insulin resistance, diabetes, and overall metabolic dysfunction. ALA has even been shown to restore levels of another potent antioxidant within cells called glutathione. Maybe you've heard of glutathione. This is kind of like a great supplement for immunity health, immune function, that kind of thing. This normally declines as we age, the glutathione content. Research also suggests that ALA may have an insulin-like effect and improve the glucose, the blood sugar uptake by your muscle and by your fat cells from the bloodstream, which will lower your overall blood sugar levels, which is good. How much ALA do you need? Well, there's no official recommended dose for ALA, but if you choose to supplement, the Linus Pauling Institute recommends 200 to 400 micro, uh, milligrams, 200 to 400 milligrams daily for generally healthy people. Higher doses of up to 600 milligrams per day may also be effective for improving metabolic markers such as insulin sensitivity or how efficiently your body processes glucose. Research also suggests that higher daily doses of up to 2,400 milligrams, so 2.4 grams, are unlikely to cause harm, but don't deliver added benefits. So more won't hurt you from this study, but more isn't always better. So it says like up to maybe 600 milligrams is a good start. Uh, special considerations for ALA, because food interferes with ALA absorption, you're going to want to take it on an empty stomach between meals or before meals. Um, also, despite its general safety, experts advise consulting with a doctor before you take LA uh, if you consume excessive alcohol or if you already have diabetes, liver disease, thyroid disorder, or thiamine deficiency. So make sure that you talk with a doctor. Well, you should probably talk with a doctor no matter what, uh, someone that you trust when it comes to adding or taking something away from your regimen. Uh, so ALA is number one. Number two, vitamin D. As we said, a huge percentage of the population is deficient in vitamin D. The metabolic benefit of vitamin D is that they have receptors in the body found on nearly all cells in the body, which means that this essential nutrient has incredibly widespread effects on health, including most metabolic processes. Uh, specifically, vitamin D appears to have anti-inflammatory effects, which we live a very high inflammatory lifestyle. Um, we also support normal insulin production when you take vitamin D. Low vitamin D levels have also been associated with obesity, insulin resistance, heart disease, and diabetes. So many of us are coming up short, mainly because we don't get enough exposure to sunlight, which is one of the biggest drivers for our bodies to start making vitamin D and, and fulfilling its needs. The average American spends 10% of their day outside, which is nuts. We, and it's probably even worse in the winter time, especially as you get into those, uh, higher latitude or lower latitude places that just going outside is just not an option. So, you know, wherever you live, make sure that you adjust and how much vitamin D do you need? The RDA, for vitamin D is 600 IUs per day for adults that are under the age of 70. So 600 per day if you're under 70 and a little bit more, 800 per day if you're over 70. Older uh, adults are gonna need a little bit more vitamin D supplementation. Uh, but these doses may be low for optimal health, for optimal health. This is just kind of like that RDA minimum. Many experts believe that blood levels of vitamin D should fall in the range of 30 to 50 
nanograms per milliliter. And to hit this mark, you're going to likely need 1,500 to 2,000 IUs. 1,500 to 2,000 IUs of vitamin D per day. That's with the sunshine and the supplementation. Additionally, some benefits of vitamin D, uh, such as reduced diabetes risk, appear to kick in around 2,000 IUs per day. Special considerations when taking vitamin D, choose vitamin D3, vitamin D3, which is more effective at raising your levels than vitamin D2. Vitamin D3 is the one you want to choose. Because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, it should be taken with a fat-containing meal or snack to boost absorption. Something like Greek yogurt, something like nuts, something that has fat containing in it so that it can help absorption. At the doses mentioned above, vitamin D is quite safe for most individuals, but it may interfere with a few medications, such as statins or corticosteroids. Uh, corticosteroids. So vitamin D. Number three, B complex vitamins. B vitamins play a major role in metabolism, including breaking down carbohydrates into sugar, glucose, and helping the body use fats and proteins. So a daily B complex, which provides usually all eight of the vitamins, it may be an efficient way to support your metabolic health, um, particularly for pregnant individuals, vegans, older adults, and people with digestive conditions like celiac or Crohn's disease, um, all of who may struggle to obtain or absorb adequate vitamin B from dietary sources. Uh, the following are what B vitamins are. So there's nine of them. You got thiamine, B1, riboflavin, B2, niacin, B3, uh, panthothenic acid, B5, pyridoxine, B6, and then you probably have heard of these, biotin, B7, folate, B9, and finally, B12. So here are a few ways that they impact your metabolic health. B6 plays an important role in reactions that regulate glucose, fat, and protein metabolism, and higher B6 levels have been associated with uh, reduced risks of type 2 diabetes. Um, additionally, animal research suggests vitamin B6 may lower blood glucose levels and combat oxidative stress and its associated cellular damage. Low levels of folate and vitamin B12. Folate and vitamin B12, if you are deficient, have been associated with cellular inflammation, uh, increased creation of fat, and an amino acid called homocysteine. High levels of this homocysteine uh, are linked with atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Yikes, insulin resistance and type two diabetes. Those are big ones. So you do not want to be deficient in B12. Supplementing with folate and vitamin B12 with a B complex supplement has been shown to effectively lower those homocysteine levels, helping prevent metabolic dysfunction. Uh, how much do you need? Well, the RDA for B vitamins vary from B1 all the way up to B12 and are slightly higher in men. Um, B1, about a microgram, B2, about a microgram, B3, you need 15 micrograms, uh, B5, five micrograms, uh, B6 is just a uh, one microgram or more. And then B7, 30 micrograms, B9 is 400 micrograms. If from food, uh, not supplement would be the best for that one, they say. And then B12, two and a half micrograms. Remember, that is the RDA for those. When you take a B complex supplement, it often exceeds these amounts. So you don't really have to worry about the minimum RDA if you do take a B complex supplement because usually they're higher than what these RDAs are. Uh, however, because B vitamins are water soluble, many of them are not stored in the body and you'll excrete whatever you don't need when you pee. So that just means that supplements containing doses higher than the RDA are unlikely to cause problems because you can get rid of the excess. However, it's important to know that there have been cases of neuropathy, weakness or numbness or pain with excessive doses of vitamin B6. So the experts here recommend consulting with a physician before taking more than the amounts of uh, a B complex supplement if you're gonna be doing that. People on plant-based diets in particular may benefit from a B complex because of that B12, um, since B12 is just predominantly contained in animal products. So there are the B vitamins, number three. Number four is curcumin. Uh, at their core, metabolic diseases are inflammatory diseases. So inflammation is usually at the root of most chronic metabolic diseases. 
For example, inflammation contributes to insulin resistance, which can lead to diabetes, and blood vessel damage. Fortunately, curcumin, the compound that gives turmeric its golden hue contained in turmeric, this is an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant powerhouse that reduces inflammation and oxidative stress, all at the cellular level. How much curcumin do you need? There's no official recommended dose for curcumin, but supplements are dosed at 500 micro, uh, milligrams per day, which appears to be safe. One study found that 500 milligrams three times a day was safe and effective for reducing pain, pain reducing benefits. Interesting. 500 milligrams three times a day. Uh, special considerations for curcumin. Curcumin is fat soluble. So consider taking it with a fat containing meal or a snack that will boost absorption of this, uh, this curcumin supplement. While curcumin is generally safe, it does have antiplatelet effects, so it can thin the blood and amplify the effects of drugs like aspirin and warfarin. It may also interfere with iron absorption and cause problems for people who are borderline iron deficient. And for me, I don't know why, it might have been the supplement that I took. For some reason, it gave me a little bit of vitamin belly when I started taking curcumin for the first time, uh, meaning that it did give me like a nauseous feeling um, and and kind of it made me sweat a little bit, but that might have been um, just the level that I took or the time that I took it, or I didn't take it with a fat, um, uh, fat containing meal. So I haven't really gone back to curcumin, but everyone's talking about it. We do try to put a lot of turmeric on our food and we do put a little bit of turmeric in our, in our, um, bulletproof coffee in the morning. So, um, that's kind of how we get ours in. Number five is a big one. Magnesium. Magnesium is, a, is it's an essential mineral that activates enzymes needed for hundreds and hundreds of biochemical reactions in the body. Research also suggests that magnesium plays a vital role in improving insulin sensitivity, which allows your body to process that blood sugar efficiently. It appears to do this by enabling the cascade of glucose metabolizing processes triggered by insulin binding to its receptor. So insulin is the key that puts the key in the lock to open the cell door so that that blood glucose can go in. They're saying that magnesium plays a vital role in this. Um, how much magnesium do you need? The RDA for magnesium is 400 to 420 milligrams per day for men and a little bit less 310 to 320 milligrams per day for women. Uh, but around 50% of Americans are not hitting that mark due to in part increased consumption of processed foods and decreased consumption of vegetables and other magnesium rich containing whole foods. Uh, there are several varieties of magnesium supplements, several. You have magnesium glycinate, citrate, lactate, chloride, threonate, and aspartate. All of these individual varieties of magnesium are generally well absorbed, while magnesium sulfate and oxide, they just not as bioavailable to absorb. So, uh, the sulfate and the oxide, not so good. Um, all, a lot of these other ones are really, really good at, at helping with, um, specific goals like sleep magnesium. We take at night, a Ned supplement called mellow from the company, Ned. Great, great company. Uh, we have a discount code J A M E E M A R E. It's Jamie Marie. So if you do want to use that, feel free to get uh, anything off of Ned's website. I definitely recommend we do uh, the mellow every single night and they have a really cool brain blend, which is great. Uh, we can put that in our coffee sometimes. Special considerations for magnesium. If you have any form of kidney disease, we recommend talking to a doctor about that, whether you're going to supplement or not. Uh, otherwise, magnesium is considered fairly safe, but High doses in certain forms, like the carbonate, the chloride, the gluconate, or the oxide, it may cause diarrhea or cramping. Some people do take these uh, laxative supplements that have the certain kind of magnesium in it that helps uh, with constipation or anything like that. Supplements may also interfere with certain antibiotics and osteoporosis medications. So if you're on antibiotics or osteoporosis medications, probably uh, talk to someone before you start supplementing with magnesium. Number six is omega-3 or fish oil. Omega-3 fatty acids are essential polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs, P-U-F-A, that are incorporated into the cellular membranes of every tissue in the body, where they enhance cellular communication, influence gene expression, and help build the cell's actual structure. 
incredibly important. Among their benefits, omega-3 have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, they have been associated with several favorable metabolic changes, such as reduction in triglycerides, reduction in blood pressure, and reduction in body fat levels, as well as improved insulin sensitivity, helping your body uh, and insulin do its job better. There are three primary omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, DHA, and then again, we have the ALA. EPA and DHA are sources such as uh, fatty fish contained in this fatty fish and algae are considered long chain fatty acids, which can be used directly by your body. They are so beneficial. Um, I listened to this episode the other day where this man was talking about how you should probably be eating salmon or some other form of fatty fish, not like the super um, lean, uh, like like tilapia wouldn't count really here because there's not a whole lot of um, fatty uh, tr- uh, omega-3s in tilapia, but salmon at least two to three times per week and then still supplement with an omega-3 supplement every day, which I thought was crazy, but he said a whole bunch of data and, and, uh, he'd been studying it for 40 years. So I was like, okay, well, um, maybe I'll share that one, uh, here in, in the next upcoming weeks, because that was super interesting. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids are found in salmon, mackerel, even things like walnuts and flaxseed. And research shows that Americans are not consuming enough of this certain omega-3 through our diet alone. Um, and we're consuming way too many omega-6s that are, um, just getting the, ratio way out of, um, proportion and the omega sixes come from the oils and processed food usually. So, uh, reducing your processed food intake, increasing your salmon or fatty fish intake. Uh, great, great idea here. How much do you need? Women need around 1100 milligrams of ALA omega threes daily while men need a little bit more at 1600. The dietary guidelines for Americans recommend at least 250 milligrams of combined DHA and EPA per day, minimum 250 combined. Uh, But Levels Health Advisor, Dr. Mark Hyman, he recommends up to 2,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA that is split into two doses. So if you took 1,000 in the morning, 1,000 at night, combined EPA, DHA, um, that's important. And if you uh, look on the back of your fish oil supplement, sometimes it'll be a very small percentage of um, of EPA and DHA, and it'll fill it with other uh, fats just to have a, um, a full capsule. So those are the ones that you want to avoid. You want to avoid the ones that have like the fillers in the very small amount of EPA and DHA. Yes. I think you're going to, um, get what you pay for in this because when you have those larger amounts of EPA and DHA, the supplement's going to cost a little bit more, but it's going to be so much more beneficial. So try to avoid those ones that, uh, don't have very much EPA or DHA. A special considerations for omega-3, the conversion rate of ALA into EPA and DHA uh, in the body is super poor. So supplements containing those EPA and DHA, such as fish oil or algae oil or krill oil, those are going to be your best bet and maybe better for inflammation. Look for supplements that have undergone molecular distillation, which removes heavy metals and other contaminants that fish usually absorb. So we got omega threes. Uh, number seven is selenium. Selenium is a, an essential trace mineral that supports your normal thyroid function and packs an antioxidant punch, both of which are crucial for optimal health. Um, selenium is found in high concentrations in the thyroid gland. And that gland is the one that produces the T3 and the T4 hormone that regulate your cellular metabolism throughout the entire body. Um, how much of this selenium do you need? 55 micrograms per day for adults um, is what the minimum RDA is. But research on the higher amounts of selenium are mixed. For us, we just eat a couple Brazil nuts. We try to do uh, maybe five Brazil nuts every night. Sometimes we'll stack that with our berries and our dark chocolate as our late night snack. Um, I think that instead of doing a selenium supplement, I really think that just a few Brazil nuts. You could buy a huge bag of Brazil nuts at a Costco for what, 10 to $15. And that bag will last you for a month. So, um, that's kind of what we say. It works a little bit better than a supplement. It's a little bit cheaper and it makes more sense to do it from a whole food. Um, special considerations for selenium. 
Early signs of excess selenium intake include um, metallic taste. So if you start to taste metal in your mouth or uh, have garlic type of breath without eating garlic, if you need, notice either of these, you will most likely want to lower your dose. Um, if you don't want to take a pill, again, two to three, up to five Brazil nuts a night, depending on your size. Uh, each nut contains 70 to 90 micrograms. So, you know, if the goal is 400, you know, you're sitting right there. Or if the minimum, they say the minimum is 55, yikes. Uh, that's like one Brazil nut. So, uh, I think we're looking for a little bit more optimal though. Try to get up to that 200, 300 mark. Number eight is zinc. Zinc is an essential mineral that activates enzymes needed for hundreds of vital biochemical reactions in the body, including those that regulate vitamin D activation and thyroid function. Uh, found in high amounts in the, a pancreatic beta cell, uh, zinc is vital for the proper creation and storage and release of insulin. So zinc helps insulin do its job. Uh, how much do you need? How much zinc do you need? Well, the RDA for zinc is eight milligrams daily for women and a little bit higher, 11 milligrams daily for men. Um, you can supplement a little bit more than this if you want to, but the beneficial cap, uh, really seems to be around 25 milligrams per day. Um, studies also have shown that excessive zinc intake may lead to elevated HbA1c levels and high blood pressure. Um, so stay below the upper limit of 40 milligrams per day, unless your healthcare provider suggests otherwise. Um, I know that we up our zinc intake a little bit when we start to feel sick, or we know that there might be people around us that are sick. Zinc has been a great way for us to kind of supplement and let our body fight off anything that we may encounter. Um, so maybe give that a shot and then special considerations. It may interfere. Zinc will maybe with a few medications, including antibiotics and, um, it might impact copper absorption. So long-term zinc supplementation should include, uh, some sort of copper if you're going to do it long-term. Um, and just think about if you're doing a short term, it probably won't matter that much. Number nine, vitamin C. Oh, we hear about this all the time. Vitamin C is often touted for its immunity benefits, but it's also an important antioxidant that limits the damage, uh, effects of free radicals, the ones that promote oxidative damage, inflammation, and metabolic dysfunction. So, uh, the only thing that really worries me about vitamin C supplements is something that I heard from Sean Stevenson from the model health show. He talks about how a lot of the vitamin C supplements that have absorbic acid in them, which is usually what a vitamin C supplement is. Uh, a lot of the companies are kind of trying to get the most cheap version of this. And actually these absorbic acid supplements that aren't high quality have been shown to have detrimental effects. Um, he, Sean Stevenson recommends a paleo Valley supplement, uh, which seems to be made of more whole natural foods, camu, camu berry, that kind of thing. Um, so you might want to check out paleovalley.com. He has his discount code is model usually. So M O D E L. Um, that might be the supplement that you want to go when it comes to vitamin C. Uh, I bought mine off of Amazon and I turned the package around and it was exactly what Sean Stevenson was talking about. So I was like, ah, dang it. Did I get the wrong one? Um, so I'm still kind of figuring that out. But the RDA for vitamin C is 75 milligrams per day for women and a little bit higher, 90 milligrams per day for men. Um, research, some research suggests that above higher doses ranging like 200 to 1,000 are likely safe and they offer metabolic benefits. So the more you take here, if it's the good kind, up to 200 to 1,000 milligrams are likely safe and may offer metabolic benefits. That's good to know even though the RDA is 75 minimum for females and 90 for men. Uh, special considerations for those with kidney stones or who are predisposed to forming stones, uh, definitely speak with your physician before doing vitamin C because there is a potential risk that it can contribute to developing certain types of stones. Nobody wants that, yikes. Uh, for most people, vitamin C is relatively safe and has a low risk of toxicity, toxicity and side effects if you stay under the upper limit of 2,000 milligrams. If you consume too much, you may experience what they call disaster pants or gastrointestinal distress, such as diarrhea, nausea, and cramping. For me, I get my vitamin C. I try to get it from uh, fruits, and I also stack it with my joint supplement um, and collagen. So vitamin C has been shown to be a huge boost 
to the effects of collagen and um, things like glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM powder. These uh, supplements I've been taking for a while for joint health because I under ate for a long period of time because I was always moving as an athlete and I didn't really, um, I didn't give my body the building blocks that it needed because I kept breaking it down, breaking it down. So the first thing to go were my joints and my tendons. So that's why I was always feeling pain there. Um, my muscles felt great. The muscle bellies were strong. Um, I looked strong, but just the connections of the tissue, uh, at the joints were always one of my just really, really, it's, it was a frustrating battle that I dealt with. And ever since I started taking vitamin C and I usually do this in the form of, um, like four mandarin oranges or one big orange and a, a supplement. And I do that once in the morning, once a night, and it has been helping a, a ton with my, um, joint health. Also the mobility that I do on a daily basis. So it's like a bunch of things that stacks together. Um, okay. Little sidebar there. Number 10, final one, CoQ10, CoQ10. CoQ10 is a powerful antioxidant found in cells throughout the body, most abundantly in the heart, liver, and kidneys. It's vital for energy production and serves as an essential component of the electron transport chain, which is essentially just a series of reactions in your mitochondria powerhouses of the cell that make energy in the form of ATP. So CoQ10 helps the mitochondria do what they need to do to make energy. Important right here. Um, how much do you need? Well, there's no recommendation that is official for CoQ10, but experts often recommend 30 to 200 milligrams per day in the form of gel capsules, which tend to be absorbed a little bit better. Uh, higher dose, doses up to 400 milligrams per day appear safe, but may not be necessary. So they recommend 30 to 200 per day in a gel capsule form. Uh, special considerations, it's fat soluble. So take this with a fat containing snack to boost absorption. It's relatively safe with no serious side effects uh, that have been reported, but some people do have mild side effects such as digestive upset and maybe ins insomnia. It may also interfere with medications like insulin or blood thinning drugs like warfarin. So make sure that you check with the doctor if that's something that uh, you're taking. All right. So that was 10 vitamins and supplements to consider for your metabolic health. Let's talk about f uh, five vitamins and supplements that you may want to skip. Um, supplementing these nutrients and compounds generally tend not to be the best way to reap metabolic benefits. Uh, here's why, and we'll talk about why and what to do instead. So calcium is number one. Low calcium levels have been associated with impaired insulin release, while other studies show an association with less insulin resistance. Calcium supplementation doesn't have clear benefits. It may even cause harm. A study analyzing health data over 10 years found an association between calcium supplements and plaque buildup in the arteries. Aim for 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day from food sources. Uh, they do recommend things like sardines, almonds, tahini, and dark leafy greens. Um, cook the leafy greens to reduce the oxalates, which can inhibit calcium absorption. And then some people agree dairy products. Others don't. The reason why, uh, dairy products have calcium in them is because they've been fortified. So, you know, that's kind of a hot topic right now. So you can decide there. Uh, but calcium, maybe not the best in supplement form, probably best to get your calcium through whole natural foods. Next up on this list is fiber. Now we talk about fiber all the time being super important, especially when you get it from whole natural foods, their fruits and vegetables. Uh, fiber mostly passes through your digestive system intact. And what fiber does really well is it slows the absorption of sugars from the carbohydrates that you eat so that your blood sugar spikes and dips aren't quite as bad. Fiber is also fermented by your gut bacteria. So it's like food for your microbiome. Um, and this produces beneficial metabolites called short chain fatty acids. These are associated with improved insulin uh, sensitivity, weight regulation, and decreased inflammation. All great things. But you might want to consider skipping the fiber supplements uh, because many of these contain higher sugar and artificial colors and flavors just to make them taste better. Fiber from whole plants are far superior here. 
This is going to promote stable blood sugar and it's going to feed your gut bacteria. So aim for 30 to 50 grams of fiber per day from sources like chia seeds, flax seeds, avocados, beans and lentils, and my favorite berries. Um, you could go for the 30 to 50 grams per day, or uh, if you want to be a little bit more uh, precise on the measurements for every thousand calories you eat, go for 15 grams of fiber. So give that a shot. Uh, next up on the list, green tea extract, man. If you think about all the superfood talk out there, you hear green tea all the time, but green tea extract, forget the claims that green tea extract supplements can boost your metabolism, uh, or they help you with fat burning or they are a weight loss supplement cure. Their true benefits are relatively modest and they have the potential to be a little bit dangerous here. They've been associated with liver damage, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, tremors, and confusion in adults and children. The good news, sipping actual green tea offers real benefits without side effects. Now this is a lot, but they say that drinking six cups of brewed green tea per day has been associated with the risk of developing type two diabetes. And then a huge meta analysis showed that green tea consumption might reduce fasting glucose and HbA1c levels. These effects are, are likely due to the antioxidant activities and polyphenols in green tea. Um, but just know that the green tea extract might not be quite as good. So when you look at this supplement that comes in a pill and it says green tea extract on the back, you may want to consider skipping that and going with the straight up real brewed green tea. The next one's a little bit controversial, melatonin. How many of us take melatonin on a regular basis? I know a lot of people I talk to take melatonin every night to go to bed. Uh, melatonin is a hormone. It is naturally secreted by the pineal gland in the brain that stimulates sleepiness and regulates circadian rhythms. In addition to helping you get enough sleep, which is crucial for maintaining your balanced blood sugar, melatonin also functions as an antioxidant and possesses anti-inflammatory properties, which helps counter oxidative stress and damage that can lead to insulin resistance and overall metabolic dysfunction. But instead of taking melatonin supplements, many of which are dosed unnecessarily high around three to five milligrams when research really suggests 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams is adequate. Some of those are three to five milligrams and the research suggests 0.3 to 0.5. That's a really high dose. So instead of using these melatonin supplements as a crutch to help you go to sleep, support your brain's natural melatonin production just by dimming the lights when the sun goes down making sure that you minimize screen time right before bed and popping on maybe a pair of blue light blocking glasses after the sun sets. If you do have to have lights on literally the reason why we don't sleep anymore is because we are trying to go against nature. And now that we have the light bulb, we can have lights on all day, every day. Now that we have TV screens and now that we have phones, these are huge stimulus to our brain. And then as we get closer to bed, we are just rocking with all this stimulation. And we expect that just like a light switch, we can turn everything off and then our brains will turn off and we can go right to bed. We say that we have insomnia. We say that we have sleeping problems. It's all the things that we do throughout our day that are not natural that lead us to have this lack of sleep. So melatonin, yes. While if you're traveling across the world and you're coming back and you're experiencing jet lag and you need to kind of nudge your circadian clock back on, uh, on track. Yes. Could be a great supplement to do for a few days, not over a prolonged period of time, get morning sunlight. I mean, all the things that we talk about when it comes to getting better sleep, get morning sunlight as soon as you can with a little bit of movement, make sure that you're adequately hydrated early and you don't get it all late. Make sure that you minimize, uh, eating within two to three hours of, of going to bed, lights within one to two hours, um, screens and all that stuff, bring them down. And then just maybe get yourself into a nice little sleep routine so that your body can be adapted and, and accustomed to a routine that knows when sleep is coming. Things like getting a little bit hot with a hot shower or bath before you go to bed, will start to have your, uh, body temperature drop, making sure that your room is dark and quiet and, maybe utilizing things like I like to use, if I'm going to use any kind of supplement, the brain FM app, I use the, um, 
uh, deep sleep track, which just knocks me out right away. So uh, melatonin should not be used on the regular. There are some very uh, detrimental effects to doing that. It is a hormone. So just like testosterone, just like insulin, just like vitamin D, like these are hormones that you uh, have a chain, have a cascade of events. It's not just like when you put one hormone in, it only affects that one hormone. Your body is a system of checks and balances. So when you mess with one check over here on the other side of the equation, something else is going to be messed with. And then over time that could really cause some not so good health benefits. So melatonin, try to take away the supplement, try to just get your body on track with all the things that we talk about when it comes to getting good sleep on this podcast. And lastly, Probiotics. Probiotics. Promising new research suggests that probiotic supplementation containing a bacterial strain called Acromancia mucinophila may improve insulin sensitivity, uh, abnormally high insulin levels, and total cholesterol in overweight or obese insulin resistant individuals, which is great. However, according to Levels, uh, Dr. Gottfried, we're still in the early stages of knowing when and how to use probiotic supplements for maximum benefit. And current research suggests that consuming probiotic-rich fermented foods may be a better option. Uh, Things like kimchi, things like uh, yogurt, kefir, uh, trying to just get a probiotic that's not even refrigerated, probably not the best route to go. The best probiotic that we've found is from a company called Seed, S-E-E-D. It has a capsule that has a certain technology in it where it releases in two different waves. Um really like what seeds doing. We've used it for a while. We used it when we were traveling. Uh, it seems to be helping, but really, I think if you just go for the fermented foods, uh, get your fill of naturally occurring probiotics, kimchi, sauerkraut, kvass, kefir, unsweetened, no sugar yogurt. Um, and we also did a two part masterclass on a lot of the supplements that I really, really enjoy the ones that I think are the most bang for your buck when it comes to your performance. Um, I'll leave those, that two part masterclass episode link in the description of this episode and including things like adaptogenic mushrooms and supplements, uh, that help me personally for performance and that I have used since I was, uh, younger. So check those out if you want. And then if you have any other questions on supplements that you take supplements that you, uh, are thinking about, Creatine, I think, is like a, an amazing supplement for just overall health. I think most people should be taking creatine. Um, and then I have a whole folder on my phone full of supplement content that I can send you if you have an individual question on a certain uh, supplement or uh, goal. So let me know if you have any questions on that. And that's it, my friends, for this episode. Thank you for joining me on this Fuel Up Friday episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Please share the knowledge that you gained with your friends and family and hold each other accountable. And if you enjoyed this content, it does help a ton if you could take a screenshot of this episode, post it on your stories, and then leave one takeaway, one thing that you learned, and make sure that you tag me and share your journey. Tag me at Living the Dream underscore podcast or at Coach Damien underscore SD. And let us know how this episode benefited you. Let us know what we missed. Let us know what we got wrong. Please tell us how your experience with vitamins and supplements and what has worked well for you, what hasn't worked well for you. Uh, What has been a game changer for your life? We really want to know. Message us if you have any suggestions or tips that would help your Living the Dream team that we can discuss on future episodes. And I'll be right here with you, working on making us stronger, happier, and healthier humans. Until next time, friends, keep living the dream.